you will, open your Bibles to the Gospel of Luke, Luke chapter 15, and we're going to be looking at the entirety of that chapter this morning. Again, the Gospel of Luke chapter 15, we'll begin in just a moment in verse 1. I've made the remark a number of times in our uh, journey uh, through this particular gospel that in it uh, we find Jesus saying some things that, uh, that challenge us, uh, that uh, uh, should even be uh, concerning to us as he sets before those that would make the claim of being desirous of following him, of knowing him, of uh, receiving from him that which he uh, offers, that he puts before them some difficult, unrelenting types of challenges. And so for me, it's been easy over the course of my now nearly 50-year Christian journey to conceive of God as a very stern, very difficult taskmaster whom, as I would approach Him in repentance, and in faith, would look at me and rebuke and reject me, saying that your faith is not genuine enough, your repentance is not sincere enough, depart from me. I never knew you. And indeed, we must consider the challenges that Jesus lays before those who would follow after Him. But we must also consider the great reality that He wants us to understand, that He reveals Himself as the faithful and gentle shepherd who looks after and looks for His lost sheep, as the compassionate Father who constantly scans the horizon, looking for those who would return unto Him, that indeed, that if we are to have a, a fully orbed understanding and appreciation for the one that we call God, that we must also think of Him as indeed the Savior, who does, who does seek and save the lost. And so let's look at uh, three parables unique to this Gospel of Luke, and which, again, Jesus reveals this as the great endeavor, the great mission, the great purpose for His coming into our world was to save lost sinners. Begin in verse 1. Now the tax collectors and the sinners were all drawing near to hear Him. And the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. What man of you having a hundred sheep, if he has lost one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. Or, what woman having ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and seek diligently until she finds it? When she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I lost. Just so, I tell you, there's joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. And he said, there was a man who had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took a journey into a far country, and there he squandered his property in 
reckless living. When he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need. And so he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into his fields to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father, but uh, he was still a long way off. His father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring quickly the best robe and put it on him. And put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. And bring the fattened calf and kill it. And let us eat and celebrate. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, and they began to celebrate. Now, his older brother was in the field. And he came and drew near to the house, and he heard music and dancing. And he called one of his servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, Your brother has come, and your father has killed the fattened calf, because he has received him back safe and sound. But he was angry and refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him. But he answered his father, Look, these many years I have served you. I have never disobeyed your command. Yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. And he said to him, Son, you are always with me. And that that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad. For this, your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. Pray with me. Father, we thank you for your testimony to us. The testimony that you indeed are our Savior. Our singular hope for eternal salvation. It is to you we look, it is to you we come. Thankful that you graciously, that you graciously receive all who come to you in repentance and in faith. God, may we rest, may we trust in you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We see in these three connected or thematically connected parables, the illustration of the truth that God is gracious and that He is eager and that He is powerful to save. That is, that He, from the first testimony regarding the first rebels there in the Garden of Eden, is the one who comes and seeks after those who have gone astray. If you'll remember in the story of Adam and Eve and in their rebellion against God, that they did not recognize their sin and their nakedness. They they ran and hid from God, and it was God who came and sought after them. And that God has been doing from that very moment. If man is left to himself, he will never seek God. After God. Now he will seek after God's and he will seek after that which God has, but he will never seek the God of the Bible. But the God of the Bible is the God who rescues and saves. And so we see here in this first parable, and again we we know them well, we've heard them since our childhood, the, the parable of the lost sheep, and we see the the setting for the telling of these stories here first, and I would note that here Luke tells us that there are two types of sinners that accompanied Jesus. There are sinners who 
knew they were sinners, and there were sinners who did not know they were sinners. And I would submit to you, you need to understand this, that the only kind of sinners that God ever saves is those sinners who know that indeed they are sinners and they need a Savior, and that Savior's name is Jesus Christ. That is, for those who think that they are not sinners, then they have no need of a Savior. They have no need of salvation. And so we see in this first group the Pharisees and the scribes who were the religious aristocracy, and they thought because of their moral behavior and their allegiance to the way that they understood God's revelation of law, that they indeed could stand before God with clean hands and pure hearts. And yet, nothing could have been from the truth. And yet, we find those that should have been uh, the most estranged uh, people uh, possible from the Lord Jesus Christ, namely those characterized as tax collectors and sinners, uh, uh, the drunks, the, the immoral, uh, the thieves of the world, they were uh, attracted to this Lord Jesus Christ. They, they, they were drawn by His words. They, they understood that they were not hopeless, that there was, there was the opportunity for this Jesus to say a word to them through which they could be saved. And so they were drawn to them because they knew. And maybe simply the providence of their life being at the outskirts of society, being, being in a sense kicked out from polite society. Maybe they felt with the greatest sense of weight their need in a way that the up and ends, the, the, the insiders to the society, the religious leaders, never felt the weight of their own sin. They never felt the reality of being estranged from God. And so, again, they could never understand, they, they could never receive this message of the Lord Jesus Christ. Those who knew they had a problem, those who were spiritually sick and knew it, they were the ones who came and listened with eager ears to the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so Jesus tells them these three parables, and while to be sure there are occasions when Jesus very pointedly speaks to these religious leaders and identifies them as a, a brood of vipers, as the whitewashed tombs and all of these other niceties that he lays upon them. He can be very blunt and very straightforward. He can also be very subtle and design for them to understand who they are and how they stand before a holy God. And so in verse 3 we see the, the first part again of this very familiar parable, and, and I guess probably all of us, rightly or wrongly, can envision some artwork, again, of the shepherd with the sheep gathered across his neck, returning that sheep to the flock. And so, we are told of a man who owns a hundred sheep, and that one of them, as is the nature of sheep, has wandered off, leaving 99 there with the shepherd, the, the, the overwhelming bulk of the flock is there in the safety, in the care of the shepherd. But when he un comes to the understanding, the, to the conclusion that indeed one is missing because of his care and his concern and he counts every sheep as precious to him, he leaves behind that 99 and he goes out at risk to himself, risk to the flock, at, at, at great uh, expenditure of, of time and, and effort and energy. He goes out into the wilderness to seek after this lost sheep. And we've, we've mentioned many times the whole idea of, of sheep, and, and we certainly understand the prophet Isaiah says that of us, what? We are all like sheep. We have gone astray. 
Please never understand, when the Bible refers to you as a, a sheep, it is not saying that you're cute and cuddly and fuzzy and just, you know, just God wants to embrace you and, you know, let you nuzzle his neck. He is saying that you are so obstinate and so misguided that if he did not constantly tend to you, you would wander off and you would destroy yourself. And that is what a sheep does. They have no ability, once they are separated from the shepherd, once they are separated from his uh overwatch from his caregiving they have no ability to defend or tend for themselves and so they are at the mercy of the elements and it is only the compassionate and dutiful shepherd that can be their savior and so Jesus wants us to understand that indeed he is that good shepherd that has entered this realm to go and seek and to save those who are lost those who who are estranged. And so, he explains kind of the upshot of his story, of his parable. He finds the sheep. He brings that sheep home. He carries it back on his shoulders. I, I, and we, we always have to be careful with parables. And I've already told you, I, I think these three parables all have one purpose. That God is a gracious Savior. They're not designed to press to the nth degree every detail, every aspect. The parables are told to, to mainly drive home one peculiar point. But I will say of this, at least the fact that the shepherd picks up and cares for, returns to the flock using his own power, his own strength, returns that sheep to the, to the fold reminds us of this. It is God who rescues, who saves. He is the one that provides the power for us to be included back into the flock. It is, the, it is not that we come to the flock in our own power and say, oh boy, I'm back. Let me rejoin. It is God in His Son Jesus Christ who puts us upon His shoulders and takes us back to the flock. And so the shepherd goes and, and seeks and finds, and when he finds him, you don't see, you stupid sheep. I ought to kick your, I ought to, I ought to just, I ought to just slit your throat right here and roast you over a fire. I'm so tired of fooling with you. All right? But he rejoices. He, re, he rejoices, and it, he announces the fact I have at great cost to myself. I have gone out and I have found this sheep that was lost. And I am exuberant over this. And I want everyone to share in my joy. And Jesus looks at those gathered around. And I think with piercing eyes, particularly at those that thought of themselves as right with God, these religious leaders, just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents. And to paraphrase a bit, than over 99 people like you that wants to criticize me for enjoying table fellowship, for welcoming sinners and instructing them and to revealing to them my, my person and my work so that they may be saved. Heaven rejoices over people like that and not over self-righteous hypocrites such as yourself. Now, they probably were mildly chagrined at this story. Maybe they're going, oh, well, huh. You think he's talking about us? Well, of course, Jesus is never one to back down. He tells the story of the lost sheep and then he tells another parable. Again, essentially with the same message. The parable of the lost coin. Using uh, a woman who uh, has uh, ten coins in, in her possession and, and she loses one of those coins and I think most commentators say it very likely could have been uh, a day's wages that, that the coin represented. And for all of us, a day's wages is a significant amount of money. That, if we lost a day's wages, that is a serious issue. 
And so it, this was a, a serious issue. And again, at great effort, she goes and she begins to, to seek diligently, not giving up until she does what? Until she finds that lost coin. And again, instead of you know looking at the coin, stupid coin, throwing it out in the woods, saying, yeah, I won't be bothered with you anymore. She announces her joy at finding that which was lost. Okay? And so, again, Jesus drives home that same point. Look at verse 10. Just so I tell you, there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Again, that heaven rejoices when God is glorified by accomplishing that which He is glorified in, namely the saving of sinners. As I, as I thought about this this week, and one of the things that we had to do my, my last year at Ibison was write a, a paper on the Missio Dei, Latin loosely translated, the mission of God. What is the mission of God? What is God's purpose? Why do, what, what does God do? Well, God glorifies Himself. And the thing that God is most glorified in is saving sinners who deserve to be damned. And so, again, we, we see this description of the angels. The angels surrounding the very throne of heaven, uh, likely in the, in the company of those that are in heaven who have been previously uh, redeemed uh, in, in before the cross, but, but say because of the cross, okay, be sure we understand that. They're, they're in heaven because of the death of Jesus that they looked forward to. We look backwards on the accomplishment of Jesus Christ. But these angels and likely uh, the saints are gathered around the throne and, and they have an understanding that, that, a, that a sinner has been saved. And maybe the discussion goes out among the angels. You know, do y'all remember Lucifer and that bunch of hell's angels that, that ran with him? And, and man, one act of rebellion and they were damned to hell forever. They were doomed. And to my knowledge, there's never been any shred, any word ever given out that this group might be redeemed, that any one of that group might be redeemed. They, they are damned, they are condemned forever. And yet, these creatures that, that God has identified as those who bear His image, that, that they have been blessed and given any, every, everything they could possibly want, and yet they rebelled against God, and it would seem because God is so holy, He, sh he should absolutely destroy the whole lot. But He has allowed them to live and to prosper and persist in their rebellion, and then what does He do? He saves some of them. Yet all of them deserve His damnation. He saves some of them, and He's been saving them for centuries. He's been saving them by His grace for His glory through the sacrifice of His Son, Jesus Christ. It is a, a singular, it is a, a unique plan. It is the plan that only God can accomplish. And He does it, and the angels recognize, this is unbelievable. I, 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 I could have never imagined God would do something like that. He is displaying grace and mercy and love that we could have never fathomed. We knew He was glorious. We, we have been with Him for eon upon eon, and we knew that we saw Him cast those stars, those billions and billions of stars out in the sky. There's so many, there uh, you, you can't even count them. And, and, and wow! But oh my goodness, these people that, that deserve to be damned. He's saving them. He is forgiving their sins. And He's not compromising anything related to His holiness. He, he is maintaining His integrity, His justice, His goodness. And He's saving sinners. He's doing it unilaterally for His own purpose and for His own glory. And they rejoice and they celebrate. 
And again, I keep reminding you, why do we, why do we come together on Sunday? It's at least partially for the purpose of celebrating before God, saying we want to be with the angels and we want to have the perspective of the angels. We want to rejoice not only that you save sinners, that you go out into the wilderness and that you rescue lost sheep, but you save a sinner like me. You saved a rebel like me. I never would have done it. I never could have done it. I never wanted to do it. And you saved me. And we want to rejoice. We just want to say thank you. Jesus, thank you, Father. Thank you, Spirit, for all that you've done from eternity past, looking forward to eternity future, in saving us. And so, he tells, Jesus tells them then a a third parable. I guess the the more well-known of the three parables, and we often refer to it as the the prodigal son. I've I've kind of just labeled it uh, the, the lost son, sons, okay? Because I think, in reality, well, it does tell us a great deal about the graciousness of our Heavenly Father and His His will and His desire and His ability to save. It again is a word of indictment that we think that because of something they might have done or because of something they might not have done, that they have gained a proper standing before God. And so we, we know the story of these two sons. And I, Now, I think it's a gloss in the text. It can't be the younger son that went astray. Yo, yo, us younger sons never go astray, okay? It, it, we're, we're led astray by the older brothers. That's the way it always goes. I just got to throw that in. The younger son goes to his father. And there's some, and I think it's a very likely understanding, at any level, even in our day, to go to a living father and say, I know one day I am going to get what you have, but I would like what's coming to me now. I think that would be one of the most offensive things any child could say to a parent. And in that culture, I believe he was very much communicating, Dad, I wish you were dead and I could have your stuff. I mean, it's, it, it, it is the betrayal of a heart of covetousness. It, it, it is a betrayal that he does not love his father. He loves what the father can give him. And that is a problem in the culture and in the church today that far too often, We do not have a love for the Heavenly Father. What we love is what we want from that Heavenly Father. And there's there's an eternal difference between those sets of affections and those sets of desires. And so the son comes and he requests and wants to have the property that would be coming to him uh, after his death. And basically he gets that property, he liquidates that property, he turns it into cash. And he goes off, and he blows it. He goes to Las Vegas. He he goes to wherever. And he squanders that inheritance, that hard-earned inheritance earned by the sweat of the Father's brow, something that in a very real sense he was never entitled to. He didn't earn it. But he took it, and he blew it. He squandered it on debased and debauched and depraved living. And, and, and in, in this, you, you see so the, the, the multifaceted dimensions of sin, how, how dastardly sin is, and how diabolical. The, I mean, uh, the scheme, uh, the diabolical scheme of, Daddy, give me your stuff. You, you're too old to enjoy it. Give it to me. Go on and die. And, and, and just the the offensive way that, that, that sin is an offense to God and it just the, the destructive realities of sin. <laughs> Let me tell you something. It is by God's grace that God doesn't always give you his, your way and it is also by God's grace sometimes He does give you your way. And He lets you 
as the old saying goes, give, he gives you enough rope to go hang yourself. Now, this, I believe, wise father gave this to, to his, his son, and he let him go. He was already in the far country as far as his heart was concerned, and so he let him physically go into that far country. He let him blow everything that he had been given, and then things fell apart. And he, became, he came to be in such great need that he basically became the herdsman, the shepherd for a herd of pigs. Nothing could have been more debased, more offensive, more humiliating for a Jew than to have to tend a herd of hogs. Everything about them, the stench, had to be a reminder every moment that he was with them of how debased that he was. Now I want to say just a kind of a, this is not really the thrust of what's going on here, but you'll notice that, that the description is that this young man in, in the midst of his misery, of his sorrow, of his suffering, of his loss, we're told in verse 17 he came to himself. I'm an idiot. He, he, he came to understand, like, I, I, what was I thinking? One of the things that I've, I've told many parents of primarily adult children over the years, you need to practice tough love. That whether literally or metaphorically, all you ever do is bail your children out of every mess they've created. And as long as you're bailing them out, as long as you're the soft place for them to land, they will never come to themselves. They, they will never get a sense of... The, 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 the greatness of their own desperation, of their own depravity. If you're always that soft place for them. Now, as I always say when I say, listen, it's not 100% guarantee. Uh, you know, that, that you may get the phone call that they found your child under a, a bridge somewhere dead. I, I can't promise you it works, but what you're doing hasn't worked so far. So, again, that, that, that this young man experienced enough pain in life that God used it providentially to come, in a sense, to his senses. Now, commentators debate, and as I said, I think you can just be too stringent and, and over-exegete, but it's certainly not an illustration that we become wise enough and smart enough to say, well, you know, the best way of life is to be a Christian. Okay? That is not what is being illustrated here. Something about his memory of his kind and gracious father was instructive to, you, to him that he realized that there was something far better and that if he would humble himself, he could go back to that father and at least live in a way that was far superior than what he was experiencing in his debasement and his debauchery. And so he determines to return to the Father. He has confession all planned out that, that he is going to humble himself uh, before uh, that, that Father. And so he finally he gets up, and verse 20, he goes back. And I think this verse 20 is the key to the, or verse 21. He comes, he goes, he starts his confession, but there in verse 22, but the father said, bring quickly the best robe. He had been looking on the horizon. He sees something. He sees maybe a shadow. And just by the way he walks, he goes, wait a minute. There's something familiar about what I see on the horizon. I recognize the tilt of his head. I recognize the way that he's walking. That is my son. Well, I tell you what, I'm going to go hide. I'm going to go back here. And you tell him that if he wants to see me, he better, he better come back and make reparations. He better, he better pay me back what he took from me. He, he better have his act all cleaned up. And there better not be any scars in his life that's going to be an embarrassment to me. Now, this gracious father runs to that rebellious son, embraces him, and instead of hearing his confession about how he has been wrong, he begins to instruct those around him to bring the best robe and put it on him. Again, 
reminding me, the believer, when we are saved, when, we're, when we trust Jesus Christ, we are clothed in the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. This man is saying, you are back in the family. You are my son. Because of what he had did or, or done? No. Because of the graciousness, of, because of the nature, the character, the will of that father, his willingness to reconcile, to restore, to rescue this young man. He comes and puts that robe around him and put, puts shoes on his feet, which only sons wore shoes in that, in that ancient world. The servants didn't wear shoes. The sons wore shoes and then what? And I can imagine this. That he probably had a, a ring that was something of a family heirloom or something of a signet of the family. And probably somewhere along his path into debauchery, he probably took it to the pawn shop and hocked it. And in, in doing that, it's like, I, I disclaim everything that connects me with that father of mine. I want nothing to do. In doing that, his, his debasement, in a sense, was complete. And the father says, why? I notice you don't have the ring. I'm going to put the ring back on your finger. You are now restored to me. And because you are restored to me, and it, because of my initiative and my will and my mercy and my love and my character, you are going to be reconciled to me and we're going to rejoice we're going to celebrate that this son of mine, that though he was dead, he has now been made alive. He has come back to me, and it is time to celebrate because of what? The mercy, the will, the authority of the Father. Again, representing what? That will of the Heavenly Father, that desire to save all, no matter how scarred, no matter how marred they are, all who come to Him, He receives and restores. But the story doesn't end there. There's a bit of an epilogue there. Verse 25. The older son, he has remained steadfast to the father, at least externally. He starts coming home, I guess, in the evening, at the end of the day. He hears of the Merriment going on, he begins to inquire as to what's going on. It's announced to him that your brother has returned. There's a party going on to celebrate his return. The, the fatted calf has been killed, and the goat has been killed, and we've got a barbecue going on to beat the band, and he wants to celebrate this great reality, this restoration, this, this bringing back to life in a sense this son that had strayed. And this son, when he hears this, makes him mad. He's angry. I thought we were rid of that troublemaker. I had put up with him for all these years. He was always messing things up. He was always upset. He was always mad. Every family dinner he made a show. Every family dinner he made everybody uncomfortable. Every family dinner he made everybody miserable. I am so I'm glad he was gone. And he's upset that he's back. And he makes a case to the Father. And again, I believe that Jesus wants to make the case to these religious leaders. Okay? Verse 29. Look, these years I have served you, and notice these words, I have never disobeyed your command. Now, who can say of anybody, anywhere, at any time, my obedience has always been perfect. That, that is an impossible claim. And so again, just like the Pharisees, the son thinks, I have performed so well, this is what I deserve. The Pharisees think, we have performed so well, we have been so uh, meticulous about uh, reading and memorizing and applying the law that, that God is going to be pleased with us. He is pleased with us. And so I've been the perfect son. This rebel has been an embarrassment to the family. And because I've stayed, you've never celebrated the fact that I have stayed. And, and this, 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 this brother of mine, he's gone out and he's embarrassed 
the family name, and now you're celebrating his return. And so the father explains the situation to him. There in verse 31. Son, you're always with me. And all that is mine is, is yours. You're, you're, you're still my son. But it is the right thing to celebrate that this brother who was estranged, he, he was as good as dead. He is now alive, he is now restored, he was lost, and now he's found. And that is a reason to celebrate. And so again, Jesus tells the story, why? To illustrate, you religious leaders, you're objecting when that erring brother goes astray, when that, that, that tax collector, when that prostitute, when, when they come to feel the misery and the weight of their sin and they go returning to the Heavenly Father. The Heavenly Father is glad to receive them back and welcome and reconcile and restore. And yet, you, you religious leaders, you indict me for my kindness, for my willingness. And it is you, as Paul would later rely, that you do not realize that it's God's very kindness it is God's goodness, it's God's mercy that has led, continues to lead you into repentance. You fail, you fail to realize that, that the, the mercy of God that's necessary even to save the good folks. How many times have I told you? In repentance, yes indeed. We need to repent of the activities and the attitudes associated with the far country, to be sure. But there's many of us that have never been to the far country. Oh, we've been in the near country. We've been in the, quote, unquote, the Father's house the whole time. But how we need to repent of the attitude that, that I've been here the whole time and I've been doing everything. I have never shamed the family name. I have always obeyed. Again. We are just as much in need of repentance as the prostitutes, the tax collectors, perverts, the abortionists, you name it. Just as much in need. And so again, we should celebrate, we should rejoice that we have a Savior who by, in His own very nature, in His own very character, in His own purpose, even in creation, was that he would be a redeemer. That he would be known as one who would seek and save the lost and could and does seek and save that which is lost. And again, we rejoice in that. The angels rejoice in that. And my encouragement is always that we enter into, that we experience, that joy as we gather together that God has been and will be until the day Christ returns. He will always be as that, that, that earthly father looking to the horizon, waiting and willing to save all who will come. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your truth for your willingness to reveal yourself as the Savior. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you are Savior. We are thankful that a loving Heavenly Father sent His beloved Son into our world to do everything that was ever needed, to accomplish everything that was needed for our salvation. He did that which was commanded and then He died on the cross as a substitute and a sacrifice for our sins. And then the Holy Spirit comes and works as we hear the truth of a saving gospel. Of a Savior who saves. He so works in us that He causes us to believe. He causes us to whether we're 
the, the, the good son that remains or the son in the far country, he causes us to realize that we need a Savior. And that Savior's name is Jesus. And we cling and we cleave unto Him. We thank You that You're indeed a Savior such as that. We pray these things in Jesus' name.